Looking to sound like you know what's going on in the world? Pop culture, social strategy, comedy, and other funny stuff? Well, join the club and settle in for the Jeff Dwoskin Show. It's not the podcast we deserve, but the podcast we all need with your host, Jeff Dwoskin. All right, Roy, thank you so much for that amazing introduction. You get the show going each and every week, and this week was no exception. Welcome, everybody, to episode 73 of Live from Detroit, the Jeff Dewaskin Show. As always, I am your host, Jeff Dewaskin. We have an extra special episode for you today. It's not often, but we have a return guest to the show. We're so happy to welcome back. Billy Van Zant. That's right. You loved Billy in episode 28 of Live from Detroit, the Jeff Dewaskin Show, and he is back. Check out episode 28 if you want to hear all about his book, Get in the Car, Jane, Adventures in the TV Wasteland. But this episode, we're going in a different direction. This episode, we're talking all about Jaws 2. That's right. Billy Van Zant was one of the stars of Jaws 2, and we're going to be discussing the movie in depth, and he's going to be sharing tons of great stories from the making of that movie from the very beginning to the very end. It's a great conversation, and it's coming up in just a few minutes. Now, some of you might immediately be thinking to yourselves, Jeff, you seem to have an obsession with Jaws. And I do. I love the movie, and I've learned to love it even more as I've been able to talk to so many people involved with the movie. Who, Jeff, who? Well, glad you asked. After you thoroughly enjoy this amazing deep dive into Jaws 2 with Billy Van Zant, I have a little homework for you. Episode 26 with Carl Gottlieb. That's right, Carl Gottlieb, scriptwriter for Jaws 2. Billy Van Zant mentions him a couple times during the interview, but Carl also worked directly with Steven Spielberg in writing the screenplay for the original Jaws movie. So some great stories in episode 26 from Carl. Also, episode 59, Joe Alves. Billy Van Zant also talks about Joe during this interview in regards to his work on Jaws 2. But Joe Alves in episode 59 goes deep into the making of the original Jaws movie, as well as Close Encounters of the Third Kind. So definitely check out episode 59 with Joe. So between this episode, episode 73, episode 26, and episode 59 and a couple extra stories in Billy's original episode, 28. You've got so much Jaws, I don't even know what, you're going to get lockjaw from this much Jaws talk. So see a doctor if that happens, but please don't hold me accountable. Just enjoy the interviews and stay safe next time you're in the ocean. Also, I wanted to take a minute to mention something going on with a past guest and friend of the show, Kelly Maroney. Kelly was one of the stars of Night of the Comet. You can hear our interview in episode 25 of Live from Detroit, the Jeff DeWaskin Show. If you're also interested in more Night of the Comet, listen to episode 62 with Catherine Mary Stewart. But back to Kelly for a minute. So Kelly was trying to track down her costume, her cheerleader costume that her character, Samantha Belmont, wore in Night of the Comet. She thought she had lost it, but then she actually, through the prop store, found out the costume, the original costume was available. So she's trying to buy it back, and she has it, and she started a GoFundMe. So if you love Night of the Comet and you want to help out, any amount is great. I'll put a link to the GoFundMe in the show notes, and you can check that out. So hopefully Kelly will get the cheerleader costume back soon, sending her all the good wishes. Speaking of wishes, I wish you would head over to my website, jeffisfunny.com. Why, Jeff? Well, I'll tell you. Because there, you can listen to every episode of the podcast. You can click a button that says, Follow the Jeff Dwoskin Show. That button leads you to a land of riches. And by riches, I mean links to all the different podcast apps, whichever one you love the most. Apple, CastBox, Good Pods, any of them. Whichever one you love the most, follow me on that or follow me on all of them totally your choice. I'm not trying to pressure you into it, but if you don't, I will cry at night until you do. But don't let that sway you. At the website, I also encourage you to join my mailing list. You can buy me a coffee. You can click on the link that says Crossing the Streams and watch all the past episodes of Crossing the Streams. You can follow my YouTube channel. Every Wednesday, 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time, we go live with Crossing the Streams. It's an interactive show where we talk about what TV shows you should be binging. Yeah. Me and a bunch of friends week after week. Tons of great suggestions. So if you're looking for great stuff to watch, definitely check out that show. And now it's time for the social media tip. 
All right, this is one of my favorite parts of the show where I share a little bit of my social media knowledge with you. A little 411 I picked up on the street. I've been deep into social media management for many, many years, and I love sharing quick tips with you. The whole idea here is awareness. Sometimes awareness is half the battle. You don't know a feature even exists. You find out it does. You deep dive a little bit on your own into it to see if it's for you. Today's awareness on Twitter is a little thing called topics. You might see it when you go to somebody's profile page. It'll just say topics to follow. Well, if you click on one of those in your For You feed, you'll be served up some cool tweets that match the topics of interest. But if you don't want to hunt and peck for certain topics in feeds, then you can go to where you find your settings and privacy and lists and profile information, bookmarks, moments. There's another button there called topics. Topics. And when you click on topics, it gives you a ton of suggested things you might be interested in. Like, for some reason, Twitter thinks I'm interested in sausage, french fries, but they get it right with movies and TV and the Marvel Universe and Spider-Man and comedy and podcasts. So I click on all of those. You can also dive into categories like food and outdoors. Once you follow a topic, then they'll show up in the For You feed. So you'll be able to find tweets that maybe you wouldn't have found otherwise that are very specific to things that you're interested in. The cool thing about the topics feature is you can also tell them things you're not interested in. So it tailors it even more and you can follow as many as you want. So check out Topics. I like it. So I know you'll love it too. And that's the social media tip. Do me a favor and tweet me at Jeff Dwoskin Show. Let me know if you love the way I'm singing the intro and outro to that section. But only be kind at Jeff Dwoskin Show on Twitter or at Jeff Dwoskin Show on Instagram. Follow me. Tweet at me. I love to hear from you. Hopefully by this point, most of you have checked out Rick Overton's amazing set list comedy special. I believe it's now available on Prime as well. If you're a Prime member, check that out. Episode 72 with Rick Overton was chock full of amazing comedy stories and stories from his career. So definitely check that out. And as always... I do want to thank everyone for supporting the sponsors week after week. Y'all never disappoint. The sponsors are always so excited and happy when they hear from all of my fans at Live from Detroit, the Jeff DeWaskin Show. So you guys keep making me look good. When you support the sponsor, you're supporting us here. And that's how we keep the lights on. Thank you so much. Our sponsor this week is Hog's Breath Saloon. That's right. After a long day of sailing, fishing, or surviving shark attacks, head over to Hog's Breath Saloon, located in beautiful Key West, Florida. Hog's Breath Saloon offers live music, great food, and don't forget to grab one of our world-famous t-shirts. Are you hungry? Well, get ready to hog it up and sink your jaws into one of our Hog's Breast crispy wings, or grab yourself a plate of whole hog barbecue nachos. Cocktail's your thing? Order yourself a hog snort or one of our world-famous hogaritas. And don't forget, still time to register for the annual Hog's Breath Backgammon Tournament. Who will win this year's prize and trophy? One dollar registration fee stands between you and backgammon infamy. Hog Breath Saloon. Because a hog's breath is better than no breath at all. All right. Well, if you're in Key West, Florida, check out the Hog's Breath Saloon. Snap a photo and Instagram you and one of their world-famous hogaritas and tag us at Jeff Tawaskin Show. Looking forward to seeing that. All right, well, with that said and done, I think it's time for me to share my amazing Jaws 2 deep dive with Billy Van Zant with you. Don't be afraid to wade into this water. It's going to be great. Enjoy. I'm so excited to have return guest Billy Van Zant with me. Billy, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Good to be here. Everyone remembers Billy, of course, from episode 28 of the Jeff DeWaskin Show. We went so deep into his book, which is amazing. And I just want to, we're going to go deep into Jaws 2 in this episode. But I do want to tell everyone as a reminder to buy Billy's book. The book is called Get in the Car, Jane, Adventures in the TV Wasteland. And we spend an enormous amount of time in episode 28 going over it. And it's highly recommended. Billy, do you highly recommend that episode? I enjoyed that immensely. I had a good time with you. And you got a lot of my stories from the book in, in that episode. It was, it was fun. Yes. And there's many more. So go, you'll go by the book. It's an amazing read. But if you listen to episode 28, you'll also know that I was watching Jaws 2, which is one of the movies that Billy starred in. I happen to mention his hat. 
And that led to a bunch of other stories. Yeah. And then and Billy's like, we should, I could talk about Jaws too for all day. And I'm like, oh, well, let's do that because that yeah. would just be great. <laughs> and so here we are. Welcome back. Thank you very much. I was actually, I'm, I'm just in the process. The entire cast is getting together for a big Zoom call because we haven't talked to each other in a while. So I'm going to see all my old Jaws 2 pals. Ooh, that sounds fun. Yeah. So, all right. So Jaws 2. So you have, we have Jaws, the first blockbuster. Steven Spielberg, huge. It's the biggest thing ever. So of course, Jaws 2 is inevitable. Yeah, it was just, it was my fir- very first movie audition. I'd been an actor. I'd, I'd done a lot of theater. I'd, done, I'd gone out for some TV things. But it was my very first movie audition. They brought me back a couple times and you had to do improvs in the room with all the other actors. And then they asked you to do monologues from things that you had done on stage. And you know, you're pulling things out of left field just to do things. I, I remember I did a monologue from a play called El Grande de Coca-Cola, which is in Spanish. And I, I did the model. It had nothing to do with anything I was doing in Jaws 2. But that was my big audition piece because I didn't have a monologue and I was scrambling to come up with something. So I, I had just done that show. So I did that. By the end of the day, Shirley Rich was the casting director, very famous old timer casting director. And if you look up her credits, she did every great movie that there was in the 70s and 60s. And she made everybody really comfortable. She said, that's part of my job. I've worked with casting directors who do the opposite. They like try and throw you off. So if you can get through this, then you can get through anything. She worked the opposite way. She made you feel relaxed and comfortable and and talented. So you had a shot at doing something uh, you were proud of. So they cast me in the film. I got a four-week contract because that's how long it was supposed to shoot. We went up to Martha's Vineyard. We rehearsed for a couple of weeks, and at that point, they taught us how to sail, and they taught us uh, to, they taught us, they made us get tan. That was our, our first two weeks of rehearsal. Get tan and learn how to sail. Pretty good job. Then at around three o'clock in the afternoon every day, we'd have a small rehearsal, and they would literally tape out, put tape on dirt on the ground around, around the hotel where we were at. The tape was all our boats. So they, we stood in our boats and we rehearsed scenes from the from the movie. And then we did improvs uh, with Roy uh, Scheider and Lorraine Gary. And, and that had nothing to do with the film either. It was just uh, just get everybody getting to know each other and get friendly and everything. And then we started shooting. And I did about, I think I did maybe two, three days of shooting. And the original script was very dark, very adult. It was an adult horror movie. And it probably would have been a fantastic film. John Hancock, who directed Bang the Drum Slowly, he was our director. His wife, uh, Dorothy Tristan, had written the script. The the premise was that Amity is now boarded up, and it's just a rundown ghost town because of the first movie. So they're trying to open up this big Holiday Inn thing to bring uh, tourists in, and that's when the first shark attack happens. So that was the tone of the, of the first film. And I had a gruesome, great, gruesome death in that film. I was I, They had me playing... The character called Sideburns. They had me grow sideburns, which I could. I, this side was great. This side was really sad, but I, I had sideburns. I was Robert Shaw's son. I was Quint's son. My opening scene was on the ferry coming from uh, Chappaquiddick, I think. And I was whistling to see Shanty, the ditty that uh, Robert Shaw sings in the first thing about bow legged women. That was, I was whistling that. That was the connection that made you say, oh, he must be the son. <laughs> right. There was no other real connection other than that. David Elliott, who played uh, Larry, he was just called Vaughn Jr. in the first one. He was the mayor's son in that and the mayor's son in the second one, in the second version. We were real badasses, nasty, nasty people. At one point, he actually, he held little uh, Sean over the water and said he's shark bait and threw him in the water. I mean, he was a psycho. And I, we got tickets for driving our bikes across the, the ferry at that point. Uh, David Elliott rips up the ticket because he's the mayor's son and this is a worthless ticket. So we were just creeps. After about two, three days of shooting, they shut the whole thing down and they sent everybody home and they started firing people. No explanation. Just a couple people got fired. We were all sent home and told, you're coming back in about, uh, you know, coming back in a couple of weeks. So I didn't know any better. I went home and uh, I got a phone call saying, okay, now you're going to go to Florida and you're going to film in Pensacola, Florida. So I got on a plane. I get down to Florida. There's an entirely new cast of people that are in the film now. Uh, John Hancock has been fired and replaced with Janos Schwark, who had 
primarily been a TV director. He did a lot of Kojaks and those kind of shows. And he had done one horror movie called Bug, about uh, all the little bugs take over the world and start attacking people. Carl Gottlieb, who wrote the original Jaws and wrote for the Smothers Brothers and wrote for uh, Steve Martin, the jerk, uh, he, great, great guy. They brought him in to rewrite the entire film as we shot it. Very strange a job for someone to have. Again, once we got to Florida, we were told we have to just get tan and learn how to sail. So we started doing that. But there were all these different people all of a sudden. And I had found out that the entire cast was made to fly out to California and re-audition. I didn't do that for some reason. I think David Brown, the producer, liked me, and, and maybe that was it. But I didn't have to re-audition. I just showed up. And all these great new people showed up. The fr I remember the first thing they made us do was we had to tread water to make sure we could swim. So they brought us out into the uh, Gulf of Mexico, and we had to tread water for five minutes. And I think if you couldn't tread water for five minutes, you were going to be on a plane in a minute. You know What they didn't realize is that some of us were tall. I was standing on the bottom and just moving my arms up and down to look like I was swimming because I didn't feel like doing the, you know, I didn't feel like treading water, but I could swim anyway. But poor Gary Dubin, who they brought in to play Eddie, couldn't swim at all. He was touching bottom and he could fake his way through the, you know, looking like he was swimming. So by the time they ended up shooting his scene where he gets killed, the look of pure terror on his face has nothing to do with the shark and nothing to do with his acting ability. He was afraid of drowning as they dragged him through the water because he couldn't swim. So that was my opening. That was the, the, the introduction to us in Florida. And I remember Murray Hamilton, who played the mayor, terrific guy, just really great guy. Weird guy, but he was terrific. He used to walk around in shorts, a dinner jacket, and a big lobster claw that would come out of his jacket. So if people went to shake his hand, they'd get a lobster claw. He thought that was hilarious. He did it <laughs> all, the time, all the time. So we, we started shooting down there. Everything was different. From the first one, it was it was lighter. The colors, the the, the costumes were brighter. The, the lighting was brighter. Even the you know when you saw the beach, when you see the the darkness of the Martha's Vineyard where the first shots are, and then Roy Scheider drives basically into Pensacola in the opening scene. Suddenly the beaches are bright white and the sun is so everything was was lighter. So it would get a PG rating. An R rating, you'd lose money at the box office. PG, they'd make a fortune. They were so determined about that. That everything was was geared around that. The problem for me with that was it meant that my character, who was supposed to have this fantastically gruesome death at the end of the film, it was touch and go whether I could die or not because they were afraid a certain number of deaths would constitute an R-rated movie. So originally, this would have been so good. I was swimming towards shore at the end of the film. Roy pulls me by one hand out of the water, and only the top half of me came out of the water. The shark had eaten the bottom half. It was grotesque, but it was great. So they decided, well, they can't do that. They can definitely get an R rating for that. So they decided instead, they're going to stick me on a pontoon, and I'll kick my legs as I swim towards shore, and then the shark would eat the bottom half of my legs. That was still grotesque. We couldn't do that. So ultimately what they did is they had a stuntman dressed like me on a pontoon, they had the shark come crashing down on top of him, and the shark and the uh, stuntman disappeared underwater. So I saw it in dailies the next day, and I said, that doesn't look like me. I want to, Why can't I film that? And they said, oh, you can't film it. I said, I want to film that. And David Brown said to me, okay, you can film it, but it's going to be the last thing we shoot. And I said, why does it have to be the last thing we shoot? He said, in case you die. So I said, okay, fine. So they put ropes around my waist. They put me on the pontoon. There were scuba divers underwater ready to yank me underwater as soon as they got the cue that the shark on its little roller coaster track was about to crash down on top of me. So that we shot it. And the, the shark came crashing down. And right before it killed me, literally killed me, the scuba divers pulled me underwater and we all disappeared. And it was fantastic. But they then decided any number, any death I had would have given it an R-rated movie because too many people had died in the film. So they quickly, when we shot some pickup scenes in, in California, they had me swim up the rocks and go, thank you, thank you, thank you, in case I was going to live. And I didn't know whether I lived or died whether I went until I went to see the movie in the theater. And I was like, oh, they let me live, damn it. But everybody remembers the thank you, thank you, thank you. So uh, that's nice. But I want that footage. I know it's out there somewhere and I want it.
<laughs> it, it was great. That scene got cut and my opening scene got cut. There were a lot of opening scenes in that Holiday Inn scene that just got cut out of the film and they they established who the characters were, which was frustrating because my opening scene was with, I had a six pack of beer, which probably, they probably thought R-rated movie. I had a six pack of beer and I was on my way to meet the, the Brebner twins, whoever they were. So that got cut out of the film too. It was like, oh, I put those two things back in. I would have been happier. But we had a great time doing the film. And my four-week uh, contract turned into 11 months because of the shutdown and because a, a couple of times the shark wasn't working. A little a rain and a little hurricane down there kind of destroyed a couple of boats at one point, too. <laughs> so, you know. And we were stupid kids, so we would uh, we did all our, all our own stunts. It was like, okay, sail your boat into that boat. Okay, sure. Smash. There were no stunt people doing that. We did it. Young and stupid. That's funny. The uh, there's a scene where the helicopter, the shark eats the helicopter. Everybody remembers that because they go, that couldn't happen. It's based on a thing that actually happened, but nobody ever believes that. So for one of the shots, they had us all get on top of the pontoons of the boat, and they threw the propellers from the helicopter at us while we were laying on the heads, lay down, and then they threw threw things at us, which are it's still in the film. But it's like you know, we did a lot of stupid things we shouldn't have done. So originally, if you were going to be Quint's son, then the, the whole movie must have been completely different. Did, did you then go with Roy Scheider's character and try and hunt it? Or was it? What, did you go with one of his kids? Like, What was some of the original plot with, with you as Quint's son? Pretty much the same structure as the second version. But the difference was we, were all, we weren't all pals and friendly little you know, Disney people. We were the bad guys and we were with the good guys and we were in the same boat, you know, so it was, we were all in peril and that sort of brought us together. But originally it really started, it, the difference, the real difference was the start, the top of the film where we were just creeps and suddenly we're thrown into this horrific situation with all the, the heroes of the film. Got it. So I had read that Howard Sackler one of the writers with Carl Gottlieb, well, at least he got a credit, but originally they were going to do something about the USS Indianapolis. Like they wanted to make it more of a prequel. That would have been a great film. I would have loved to have seen that film. You know, yes, that's true. I think he has credit on the, does he have credit on the film or does he have credit on the, I know they did a, a novel version of the, of the movie and I know he has credit on that. That was similar to the John Hancock script. Whatever, if you see the Jaws 2 book anywhere. That's the version of the uh, first screenplay. Right. I read that. And it's much more gruesome even. I also read that Steven Spielberg didn't want to come back. But then at some point he considered it. But then he also wanted to do the USS Indianapolis kind of thing. But then he got caught up because he was doing Close Encounters of the Third Kind. There was a, a, a moment, almost throughout the film, there was a moment where we thought Richard Dreyfuss was going to do a cameo from his ship. 5,000 miles away, I think he wisely, <laughs> wisely decided not to do that. There's a whole sequel thing. When you're in the, when you're in a classic film, do you really want to come back and do a second one? Roy hated being there, hated being there. He, uh, he was under contract to Universal, and this was part of his contract that he had to do a sequel. But I know he gave up The Deer Hunter, which would have been a great film for him. And I, I know he talked about that a lot. I forget there was one other film he was supposed to do, and he, but he had to give them both up to go to Jaws 2. So he was not, not a happy camper when we were making the film. He barely talked to any of us kids. Uh, when he did, he was pleasant, but he wasn't shooting a movie, the movie. He was sitting on a lounge chair in a black Speedo bathing suit and a metal sun reflector under his face all the time. And this is the tannest human being you ever saw in your life. And we're filming in the sun all day long. I don't know why he had, he did it on his time off. It was kind of strange. But uh, Keith Gordon, who played Doug in the rubber in the raft, he did all that jazz with him after Jaws 2. He played Roy as a young boy. And he said he was a completely different guy because he was doing a great, uh, you know, a great film that he wanted to do. And then he apologized, I guess. To Keith for being as uh, cold as he was back then. He was a pleasant guy, and he, you know, he worked very hard. The very first day of shooting with Janot, with the second director, who I love, by the way, great guy. And just I'll segue for a, a second. Janot and Carl Gottlieb came into an impossible situation. They just did. With a cast of people, half of whom they didn't even know, and a director that, that Roy didn't know, we had to shoot the film in sequence as we went. It was a very strange set up 
And the very first day, Roy, in front of all these hundreds of extras in the big Holiday Inn scene, he threw a massive fit. And I think it was a challenge to see if he was going to be able to push this director guy around who didn't have a lot of credits. And Janot had worked with some fantastic people in his career, and he shut it down really fast. It was an ugly moment. It was the only ugly moment on the entire movie. And I think it was a test to see what he was going to get away with. After that, they got along fine, but it was an ugly day. I mean, it was one of those things, you know, there's nobody's talking and everybody's looking around like, you know, should we leave? That was in the big, ho- in the holiday inn scene that everybody's, you know, so happy and partying with. Right. <laughs> that, that was that one. But what I was going to say is, you know, an audience doesn't care what goes into making a play or a TV show or a film. They just want to see a good product. But when you know what Janot and Carl had to go through to actually pull this off, it was it was an incredible feat. It's so impressive to me, knowing, especially knowing now, because I've been, you know, produced and directed and all this sort of stuff, knowing what they had to do to pull that off was an amazing feat. It's amazing it's as good as it is. Overall, I really enjoyed Jaws too. I mean, as a sequel, you have to believe that the shark just shows up at the same place again. <laughs> Yeah, there was there was going to be I don't know if you know this there was going to be a third one. Uh, I mean there was there eventually was a 3D movie. The original third movie was going to be a National Lampoon spoof of a shark movie called Jaws Three People Zero. David Brown called uh, Keith Gordon and he called me to ask if we'd want to be in it. I was like yeah I want to be in it. Never happened. But man it would have been fun. I never saw a script either. But I knew it was supposed to be a, a spoof of making a shark movie, which still is a good idea, which somebody should do. I did read about that. The and then eventually I think it got shut down because it became so much of a spoof. I think some of the people were upset that they were being made fun of. <laughs> oh, 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 okay. Speaking of Jaws three, D, uh, did you have any interactions or what was it like working with Joe Elves? Joe Elves is incredible. Incredible, incredibly talented man. Uh, everything you love about Close Encounters, Joe Elves. Everything you love about Jaws, Joe Elves. And I still see him time to time, and he, he still looks exactly the same. You know, his hair's a little grayer, but he looks, he looks he's the same guy. Could not be more fun to be around. And he did a lot of the, the second unit uh, directing for Jaws, too. I think that was part of his deal. He hung around with uh, us Amity kids all the time. He was, he was great. He was great. I read that he would have potentially been the director of Jaws, too, but... There was some director guild rule that you couldn't give it to necessarily someone on the set. I think that's true. I think that's true. He was there through the whole thing. And Roy Arbogast did the shark. But Joe, he did the uh, storyboards for everything we shot. They're great. Even they're just great pieces of art by themselves. But you could see he's a, he, you could see he's a good director just from looking at the storyboards. Yeah, I, I had an opportunity to actually talk with him. And like it was interesting to learn, like, He's even responsible probably for the first movie being made. He was on board before the book was even released, before Spielberg was around. And he drew a lot of those famous scenes that we all (laughs) now love from the first movie. And Verna Fields, who edited the first movie and probably helped save that too. She was uh, an exec at Universal by the time we were shooting. She was fighting for us the entire time. She wanted she wanted me to get killed so bad. <laughs> she was really sweet. I liked her. But she lost that battle, too. The only scary moment for me, I don't know if I told you this last time, uh, my brother is a rock musician. And everybody knows, little Steven. I've heard of him, yeah. <laughs> so he was touring with Bruce Springsteen at the time while I was filming that. And one night, somebody starts pounding on my hotel room door at 2 in the morning. And I thought, a lot of pranks going on in the hotel. We were the only people in the hotel. There was nothing around us. There were no hotels next to us. It was our hotel and then miles of beach, and that's it. So I thought somebody's playing a prank, and I just ignored it. The next day, I got on the the van in front of the hotel to go to the location where we were going to film the harbor scenes. The assistant director says, "Uh, are you related to the rock rock musician Van Zandt who died in the plane crash last night? And I, my, you know, this is before cell phones. I flipped out. Because uh, I thought my brother's on tour and uh, shit, you know. So I got off the van and I went into the hotel and I and I called my parents trying to politely ask, have you heard from Stephen? No, I haven't heard from him at all. Why? Oh, nothing, nothing. I was just wondering. And I couldn't find out who, you know, if he was alive or dead for a couple hours. And it turned out, um, and I did find out, it's still a horrible story, but it wasn't my brother. Uh, Leonard Skinner's band, that's when they went down. 
And but that was a scary, you know, worse for them. But it was a scary moment for me. And Stephen, Stephen came back from the tour a couple of days later. I think walked into my parents' house and saw all these funeral arrangements because people had sent them to my parents. And he looked at he basically saw his own funeral arrangements. And then he saw one of them. And went, That's all they thought of me. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, but that was scary. But for the for the most part, we were alone in that hotel. We ate the same damn menu for 11 months. And I didn't eat, uh, on the Gulf of Mexico, I didn't, I didn't eat fish. So I ate steak for 11 months, every meal, I think. And there were a lot of parties that went on that I didn't know about because I was innocent in those days. But there were a lot of a lot of parties going on. And, and I, you know, I just said, why is everybody so tired when they show up for work the next day? Because we were there for so long, we just bonded like it was our graduating class or something, you know. I also learned to play great backgammon. Everybody played backgammon on that show. And Keith Gordon and I wrote, uh, we started writing a screenplay for, we were just bored out of our minds because you didn't work all the time. And there was nothing to do because you're, it was just an empty hotel at beach and that's it. So we wrote a script called Murder in My Sanitarium. That's all I remember about it. And we wrote about 30 pages of it. And it was so intricately plotted. We knew that when you got to, when you found out who the killer was, you were, your mind was going to blow. Well, I, Keith and I found it a couple of years ago. And we're looking at it. And we're like, I can't figure this out. I have no idea what this is supposed to be. So we just never finished it. So That's funny. Oh, man. So a few questions. All right. So Roy, Sh- Roy Scheider, I had read, just as a, as a kind of tag on to what you've said that he was trying to pretend to be crazy to try and get out of the contract. Like, he really didn't want to be there. No, not at all. I think they gave him a new Jaguar just to show up, and it was sitting there for him, and he you know, he eventually drove it back to California, I guess. But it was like they kept trying to, to make him happy, and he was not happy the entire time we were there. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because if like, they had done the USS Indianapolis – that then they would have redefined the entire future movies of Jaws too, because they wouldn't have gone down the path of somehow it has to be related to the um, the bro- uh, right. Brodies. So it's like because it's weird, right? You have the same location, it happens again, <laughs> right? And then in Jaws three D, the two brothers in the future <laughs> yeah. are in Sea World, and lo and behold, two theme park and and, yes. and, uh, and two. Two sharks show up there, a baby and a mama. Yeah. And then I barely remember four, but four was, I think the idea of four is one of the kids gets, one of the Sean or Mike gets killed at the very beginning. The mom, Lorraine, goes to some island and she's with Michael King. I don't remember, like somewhere else. And the shark follows them like that. Like they're just going. That's right. Charles the revenge. And, and, you know, this time it's personal or one of those kind of things. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I'm glad for Lorraine she got to make a film, but you know it wasn't the right film to make. No, Michael Caine was in there. He was in everything at one point. I, th- I think I read he never even saw the movie, which is interesting. Well, I don't know why the, the studio people thought, oh, no, it has to be connected to the Brodies. <laughs> it's like, like in Star Wars, everything's connected to this yeah. Skywalker. Yeah. Family. Yeah. Like, <laughs> they could have just made some really, really powerful shark movies, and it would just have all been in that genre. It's, uh, that would have been great. Yeah. I still wish they'd make the Indianapolis. That, uh, it would really be good. I think I read that somebody has the script option. And if you were Quint's son, you could have just played young Quint. There you go. So boom. Now I'm even more upset. <laughs> <laughs> I did not mean to upset you, Billy. <laughs> it is scary about your brother, that story. I mean, I'm glad it ever turned out, but it's like, it's just, it, it's interesting when you, you think you, you tell that story. If that happened today, they, they, they wouldn't have, because you would have had a right. text, right. you would have had 50 people going, uh, no, this is actually who died. You know, it's, it's funny. I watched the TV show Friends, like my wife's obsessed with it. And like, I'm like, 90% of these plots, you couldn't even, you couldn't even air the show today because none of these plots would even work. <laughs> it's like, the, everything's changed. All the great Broadway shows, all the great the comedies, basically, uh, from the, the 50s, 60s, you can't do them now unless you set it in a period piece because cell phone, you know, you can't do the odd couple. A cell phone ruins the entire plot. You know? It's interesting. So, all right. So a couple of things about Jaws. Just when you thought it was safe to go back into the water, consider one of the biggest, best taglines of all time. <laughs> it, it is. It, it was great. It really was great. The Jaws 2 poster I have is one from the, the John Hancock uh, version. And it the poster they ended up coming out with 
has the skier and the shark you know, going up at her. Mm -hmm. The original one is reds. It's like a, a sunset water, and you just see the fin going sideways, and it's like, oh, it's just so creepy. That's the one I have, just when you thought it was safe to go in the water. The other interesting thing I read about Jaws 2 was that it was the first movie to use a number and not a Roman numeral in a sequel. <laughs> People hate us for that. <laughs> I always thought it was like the dumbing down of America. Like when they, when people when they when when they when Hollywood finally decided, I don't think people know what Roman Roman numerals are. Yeah, <laughs> maybe yeah, we should just yeah. maybe we should just stick to actual <laughs> numbers. <laughs> it was also the highest grossing sequel of all time until Empire Strikes Back. Rocky two. So we had maybe two. Or, was it Rocky? So I know we had we had two or three years of being the you know the highest grossing sequel, which is all about the first film. You know, really. One of the big, one of the biggest sequels of all time. Interestingly enough, it is categorized as a horror film. I find that so weird because he, when it came out, it wasn't a horror film; it was just a film. A couple of these uh, conventions, these horror conventions like Comic Con and all those things, that's when it started getting labeled as horror film. And it's like, really? I guess it is because Donna Wilkes screams through the whole thing. So yeah, <laughs> it's a horror film. The poor, the poor girl. People always give her a hard time because she screams like a lunatic at the end of that film. She's screaming because she's watching me get killed, not in the film, but the screaming's still there. <laughs> it's funny. It's like it's remembered as one of the better ones. Siskel and Ebert were not kind to the movie. <laughs> so. You know what? I don't, I, I swear to God, I don't read. Well, I do. I try not to. I don't like reading reviews, especially because most of the time I'm doing comedy. Nobody gives comedies good reviews. They just don't because it's, you know. It's not theater, you know, it's just comedy. I actually got a review once that said, it's great, it's mindless entertainment if you like that kind of thing. It's like, oh, geez, okay. Every one of my TV shows, I've got bad review, bad review, bad review. The ratings are good, the audiences like it, but the critics, you know, I don't care about the critics. Yeah, critics can suck it. Yeah. So so what was it like just kind of being on those boats? I mean, that was, that was that, it's like a, it seems like it might have been a pain in the ass. I mean, you're just floating in the water, or is it? <laughs> I'll tell you what was weird about it, because... Jeannot had never worked on the water before. You know, he, he did uh, crime dramas on television. And so we would be out in the Gulf of Mexico all day and we would get, we had walkie talkies that were hidden under on straps on the boats. And we would get, you know, the walkie talkie, okay, sail towards the reflections in the water, the sun reflections. And I was like, but the angle you're looking at it is different than the angle we're looking at it. We, we don't know what you're talking about. So it took a long time for us to, you know, how, how can you, you're out in an entire Gulf of Mexico. How do you give directions to a boat if you want them in a certain shot? You know, there's no marker you can go to. It's just water. So it took a long time for us to figure things out. And David Elliott and I were no help because we used to flip the boat over all the time. We would start sailing. The boat would go up on, on one of the pontoons. Then we'd flip it. And we actually lost, a, we lost a couple of walkie talkies. We lost, I think we lost a camera at one point. They didn't like us too much for that, but we had a good time, <laughs> good time doing it. There's one shot that I still, I still get upset when I see the film. My grandmother passed away. My father's mother passed away during the film and it was over Thanksgiving weekend. So I flew home for, for Thanksgiving, not knowing she, she was passing away as I was on the plane. So I found out she died, and I called the production office, and I said, you know, my, my grandmother passed away, and I'm, I'm gonna, they're going to bury her on Monday, so I'm not going to come back till Tuesday. And they said, oh, no, no, you're filming on Monday. I said, but my grandmother just died. Uh, but, uh, you know, Billy, you know, it's a big production. You have to be here. So not knowing any better, because, again, I was a stupid kid doing the film, I obeyed, and I got on a plane, and I went back down to Florida and missed my grandmother's funeral. And... The scene that he used me for is, I think it's Polo is taking uh, Mike Brody, who's hit his head, taking him back to shore. And he looks into the horizon and you see boats that are maybe a quarter of an inch high. That's the scene they had to fly me back to put me on a boat. You could have put me in a clown suit out there and nobody would have been able to tell the difference. But that's the scene where I miss my grandmother's funeral. It, it burns me every time I see that film. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry about that. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier, Eddie, he was afraid of water and that kind of helped because <laughs> Yeah. it was funny when I was, when I was watching it and he gets, he kind of lifts himself onto the boat and then who is uh, in the boat with him. Tina is, uh, is kind of screaming or whatever. And the shark comes and grabs him. 
And like when I was watching that, I was like, oh, I'm surprised that's not a like a room on the raft moment, you know, like in Titanic. Because I'm because my first thought was Tina didn't even try and help him. <laughs> she didn't even try and not even like. Oh. <laughs> it was like I also think it was a violent pull that the, the guys did. Yeah. Because I think they were pissed off that he couldn't swim and they had to work twice as hard. So when they yanked him under, they just yanked him. <laughs> I remember Jaws 2 when it came out. I, I didn't see it in the theater because uh, I was too young. And I remember wanting to see it and everyone telling me about it. But it was just one of those things. I don't I don't think I saw it till years later. First time I went to see it in a film, it was my, my hometown put my name on the marquee. It was really sweet. They had me there to just... Universal had me sign things there. So a lady comes up to me in the lobby and she says, oh, would you sign this thing for my uh, my neighbor? I said, oh, yeah, I'd be happy to. And I said, would you sign this thing for my son? I said, sure. Would you sign this for my daughter? I said, yeah. And I'm signing another one. She says, oh, and I need a couple for my you know, my neighbors over there. I said, fine. So I'm signing all these things for her. I said, so did you, are you going in to see Jaws too? And she said, no, we're going to see Greece because John Travolta is better than you. <laughs> that was my introduction to uh, celebrity. <laughs> You say, I don't see John Travolta here signing your <laughs> I know. <Not> to rye. <laughs> so the one death that always bothered me, and I remember like even rewatching it, I was like, oh, this is the one, the one that bothered me the most, and like always kind of stuck in the back of my head is when, and it's not even the most gruesome one, but it's like when uh, Margie, the character, gets Sean back onto the boat, yeah. young Sean onto yeah. the boat, and the shark basically just comes right up and kind of just eats her. It's yeah. not, and then like, and that's it. And it was like that. Oh, that one always bothered me for some reason. It was just like because she's so innocent. She's just so completely innocent, and you can hear her in her voice, and she's just trying to save the kid. Martha, who played uh, Margie, uh, Margie, is that it? Marge? Marge, Marge, Marge. She and her sister Susie were two of the uh, number one and number two sailors in the world when they when she got cast. And her sister Susie helped train us how to sail the boats and stuff. And she's a school teacher now. Yeah, so I, I keep in touch with them all. Do you, can you still sail to this day? I probably can, but I haven't. You haven't? Okay. There, it's funny. When, I was, when we were on the Gulf of Mexico, it didn't feel dangerous at all, despite the fact that the locals didn't want us there, and they were chumming in the water when we were shooting, trying to bring sharks in to kill us while we were shooting the actual film. So, but for some reason, on the Gulf of Mexico, it never bothered me. It never felt scary or anything. Even though, you know, you have these huge basking sharks go past you and, and uh, you know, that could have been scary. But had we filmed it in the Atlantic Ocean, I would have been freaked out. And most of the time, I'm either in the Pacific Ocean or the Atlantic Ocean. And I don't want to sail. And I, don't, I just want to be a passenger. But Gulf of Mexico just felt like it was just a big bathtub or something. Did I read that there was an actual shark that kind of came into the actual thing like while you were filming? They literally, there was a shark rodeo, they call them, which was a fishing contest, one pier down from the pier from our hotel. And they only did that to piss us off. Huh. They were chumming all the time. And we were so naive. They, they, uh, they told the kids, all those kids, don't worry about the sharks. We have uh, scuba divers with dart guns, so you'll be fine. Well, if you know anything about sharks, it's going to take two seconds. They're not going to even have loaded the thing. Yeah, so that was that was scary. Uh, uh, Keith Gordon on his little rubber boat, he had a uh, – it was a little – it was a shark maybe a, a foot long that just uh, – he must have thought Keith's boat was the mother or something. He just he followed it around for a couple of days. And then I think he accidentally was coming into shore and he killed it by, by going on over the top of it. But it's a horrible story. Anyway. Oh, I did read it was something kind of funny about the movie is in the beginning, like when Roy Brody's character, they find the orca kind of bitten and they, he's like, this is a shark. And that, that was kind of like there was a little bit of movie trolling going on. <laughs> right? right. So there was a movie called, well, Jaws came out and then Orca, the movie came out. And in Orca, Orca kills a, a great white shark as sort of a swipe at Jaws. Yeah, that, was the, that was the show who was more dangerous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was Bo Derek, wasn't it? No, oh, that I don't remember. I, <laughs> I don't know if I saw Orca. You know, you remember Bo Derek. You don't remember the Orca. You remember Bo Derek. Yeah, I remember Bo Derek, yeah. <laughs> and then you guys re-swipe back by having that dead Orca in yeah, this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Movie trolling at its best right there, right there. That was cool. That shark, that, that uh, Orca was, uh, I don't know what they made it out of, fiberglass. It wasn't a real dead animal. It was a... It was fiberglass or something that they had put together. It, they did a nice job on that, too. Pretty cool. And then director Schwark went on to do Somewhere in Time, 
Yeah. Which is, uh, you know, I'm from Michigan. So that's a Michigan classic because it was done at Mackinac Island with Christopher Reeve. That's on every woman's uh, top 10 list, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and, it's, and, and I remember the score is beautiful. Just the, the score of that film is gorgeous. And he also did Supergirl, which I'm sure you also remember the score from Supergirl. Yes. And Santa Claus. He did Santa Claus, the movie, too. Uh, who was that? Dudley Moore? Huge, huge Christmas movie. And he's, he's still working. He's still doing this thing. So important question. Do you have any of the Jaws 2 Tops trading cards as collector's items? I have all of them. Do you? Do yeah, you? yeah. Signed? They could be signed, but they're not. I have, uh, what do I have from that? I have my hat. I had the life jacket, but it, it, it was in a, it was on a shelf in a, in a garage of my house back east. And we had uh, rain damage and the thing got moldy. I had to throw it out. So I had those two because, you know, every, every good actor steals their costume. What else did I have? I, and I have the Farrah Fawcett jigsaw puzzle with her famous uh, poster picture on it that Roy Scheider gave me for my birthday uh, when we had a birthday, gave me a birthday party <laughs> when we shot. That's my memorabilia from that movie. Oh, oh the other question. Did, did you ever, before they removed it, go to the Universal Jaws ride? Uh, not on it because we were shooting uh, the Martin TV show, Martin Lawrence's show. We were shooting right near that, and I used to walk over, and my boat was on that ride. They had that the red uh, sizzler uh, parked there for a long time, uh, but I never did the ride. I, I did get to do it before they switched it to Harry Potter. Didn't realize, like, oh, it's actually based on Jaws 2 because he bites the uh, the cable, which oh, makes... Oh, oh, yeah. So that's funny. And then um, the other thing is... Uh, I thought was funny about Jaws 2 is it's like open wide say ah is that's the big killer thing where it's, <laughs> where's his smile you son of a bitch <laughs> yeah well PG it was PG yeah. or the other yeah, yeah. yeah yeah gotta tone it down yeah I know you keep in touch with a lot of the cast yeah who went on to what I mean I, you don't have to list off everyone but like didn't one of one person you were going to be a director. Keith Gordon Keith Gordon is one of the uh, hardest working directors every every great one hour drama on cable and, and Netflix, all this stuff. It's all Keith Gordon. He's fantastic. And Dusenberry's still acting. She's married to uh, Brad Fidel, uh, Oscar winner for uh, Terminator's music. And Anne went on to um, be Lucille Ball's daughter in her last series. That's, that's how I got connected. Gigi Vorgan, who played Brooke, very uh, popular uh, New York Times bestselling author with her husband, Gary Small. Uh, Jeffrey Kramer, still uh, who played Hendrix, uh, still producing uh, a lot of stuff, a lot of TV shows. A lot of us have, have veered away from acting. I still act in my plays, occasionally in film or TV. But you know, even me, I'm, I'm mostly writing. David Elliott, played Larry, is a uh, he works on the other side of the camera. He's he he works on the crew, um, building stuff, and he's been doing that for a long time. And then he ended up in. Uh, the movie about Andy Kaufman, because they, uh, I, guess, I don't know what the real story was. Like the, he'd already been retired from acting for a while and somebody either didn't show up for work or they needed somebody at the last minute. And they said, anybody here have a SAG card? And he went, oh, I do. And they gave him the role. <laughs> so he got his job on the set of the, the movie he was on the crew for. A couple of years ago, Tom Dunlop, who played Timmy, was coming out to uh, have dinner with me. Uh, he was coming out for business. And he said, let's have dinner. And I said, sure. And I said, you know, I was about to have uh, dinner with Gigi. I haven't seen her in a while. Why don't I call her and the three of us will have dinner? He said, that sounds great. And I hung up the phone and I started thinking about it. And I started making phone calls. And I called Jeff Kramer, who called Lorraine Gary. And I called this one, who called that one. And within 48 hours, we had the entire cast, the entire living cast, I think with the exception of two people, Jano Swark, Carl Gottlieb, Sid Sheinberg from Universal, Lorraine Gary, Joe Mascolo, who played Glenn. We all had dinner together in Westwood, and it was so much fun. It was so much fun. And we picked up like we had all seen each other the day before. It was so much. It was just great. Did Lorraine go on and on about Jaws the Revenge? No, I'm just kidding. It never, it never came up. <laughs> it never came up. She's a great lady. I really like her. I really like her a lot. Cool. It's, it's really, it's neat that you guys all keep in touch and it's like a little, yeah, little club, little Jaws 2 club. Oh, and Gary Springer, that's the other one I wanted to mention. Gary Springer, uh, who played Andy, he is one of the biggest publicists in, in show business. He took over his father, John Springer's business. He represents films all over the world and uh, my plays too. 
So awesome. uh, yeah, yeah, we all keep in touch. That's so cool. Well, this was so fun. Oh, Thank good, you. good, good. I, I had a good time. I don't know if I, I didn't think I had enough stories to even, oh, I did. Okay, good. <laughs> no, you did, you did great. That was, uh, it's, it's always fun kind of hearing about a movie, the point of view of someone who was actually there and you can read a bunch of stuff and there's always a top five things about Jaws 2 articles. But it's great to have uh, your perspective. I really appreciate you hanging with me again. I love it anytime. All right. How amazing was Billy Van Zant? Jaws 2, everybody. I hope you loved it as much as I loved it. I love going deep on one topic. That was a lot of fun. Check out Jaws 2 if you haven't seen it in a while. Check out Billy Van Zant's book, Get in the Car, Jane, Adventures in the TV Wasteland. Links, of course, to the book and all the Jaws podcast interviews I've done will be in the show notes. So get your jaws on and enjoy all of those interviews on Live from Detroit, the Jeff Duoskin Show. As we near the end of the show, it can only mean one thing. You guessed it. It's time for another hashtag from the family of hashtags at Hashtag Roundup. Follow us on Twitter at Hashtag Roundup or download the free Hashtag Roundup app on the iTunes or Google Play Store. Play along. Tweet with us. And one day, one of your tweets may show up in a future episode of Live from Detroit, the Jeff Duoskin Show. Fame and fortune await you. Today's hashtag brought to you by Sci-Fi Tags, a weekly game on Hashtag Roundup. The hashtag, of course, is shark-related. Hashtag add sharks to sci-fi. Take anything sci-fi and add a shark to it. The end result can only be hilarious. So without further ado, here are some hashtag add sharks to sci-fi tweets. Jurassic Shark. The Left Shark Files. Close Encounters of the Shark Kind. The Shark Night Rises. Shark Trek. Donnie Sharko. Shark Ship Troopers. These are some amazing hashtag ad sharks to sci-fi tweets. If you're feeling inspired, head over to Twitter and tweet your own hashtag ad sharks to sci-fi tweets. But here's some more for you for inspiration. Gil Gerard is Buck Rogers. Sharks on a Plane. Jurassic Sea World. The Rocky Horror Shark Show. 2001 A Shark Odyssey. The Left Shark Strikes Back. The Shark Crystal. The Day the Shark Stood Still. And our final hashtag add sharks to sci-fi tweet, Land Shark of the Lost. Oh, all right. Those are some awesome hashtag add sharks to sci-fi tweets. As always, they'll be retweeted at Jeff DeWaskin Show. Head over there, retweet them. They'll be in the show notes, so show them some love. One day you'll be there too, and you'll want somebody to retweet you. So do onto others as you want them to tweet onto you. Little advice bomb for you, just at the very last second of the podcast. Can you believe it? We're at the end of the podcast. Episode 73 has come and gone. Can't believe it. Went so quick. I want to thank my special guest, Billy Van Zant, for coming back and talking Jaws 2 with us. I am no longer afraid to get in the water, so thank you for that, Billy. I also want to thank all of you for coming back week after week. It means the world to me, and I'll see you next time. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of The Jeff Dwoskin Show with your host, Jeff Dwoskin. Now go repeat everything you heard and sound like a genius. Catch us online at thejeffdwoskinshow.com or follow us on Twitter at Jeff Dwoskin Show. And we'll see you next time.